Lawrence Krauss here. Before we begin our podcast, I wanted to let you know that the Origins Project Foundation has four or five seats left associated with our special trip to Iceland, September 21st to 25th, four nights, five days. We'll tour the iconic vistas of the land of fire and ice, one of the most remarkable geographical locations on Earth. And we'll also do several things that the public cannot normally go to, including a visit to a special carbon capture facility there. In addition, there'll be a public event with Barry and I and several local experts from Reykjavik. All told, we hope it'll be a remarkable experience that'll change your view of the world and allow you to see one of as I say, one of those remarkable places on earth. I hope you'll consider joining us. Go to www.originsproject.org and go to the travel page. And in the next two weeks, we still have those seats open before we close things up. Thanks. Charles Murray is a controversial figure and has been ever since he published The Bell Curve. He's been castigated, castigated, hated, reviled, censured, censored, and more. I wanted to have a discussion with uh, Charles for a variety of reasons. First, because I always worry that stereotypes of people are uh, inaccurate, and I like to hear people have a chance to discuss their own ideas themselves. But more interestingly, I was taken by a new book by Charles Murray called Human Diversity, which sounds like it's going to be an emotional book again, but as he points out in the very beginning, if you're looking for bombshells, you won't find them is instead a social scientist's take on the biological and scientific issues associated with human diversity in all its forms. And he, it's based on reading the technical literature and discussing things with, with uh, experts. And his point, the whole purpose behind it, is something I find very important. He argues that social scientists often base their discussions on ideology or preferences and don't refer to the scientific literature. And he thinks it's really important for public policy and social science to base their discussions on science. Um, he, uh, he, He says that social sciences have been in the grip of an orthodoxy that is scared stiff of biology. And so I think it's really great to see that combination of of using uh, science to as the basis of uh, of decision making, which is really one of the things we push in this this podcast a lot. Once we began the discussion, I discovered what a delightful, thoughtful uh, individual Charles was, and and uh, the discussion is not heavily wrought in emotional questions, but really tries to explore the, as I say, the science behind human diversity, and not focus on those hot button issues necessarily. I hope you'll not only enjoy it, but be enlightened by it and perhaps change your views of the man and at at the very least learn something about the biological basis of diversity. You can watch this podcast ad-free on our Critical Mass Substack site, as always, or you can watch it on our YouTube channel, the Origins Project YouTube channel. You can listen to it either on our Critical Mass site or on any site that hosts uh, podcasts. However you watch it or listen to it, I hope you'll enjoy it. And I hope you'll also consider supporting the Foundation primarily by subscribing to our Substack site. The funds from that go to supporting the Foundation, which produces the podcast and makes this possible. In any case, I hope you enjoy the podcast, enjoy Charles Murray, and that this uh, provokes your thinking in one way or another. Thanks. Well, Charles Murray, thank you so much for agreeing to be uh, on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to uh, to our discussion. So thanks for coming on. Well, so am I looking forward to it. Well, you know, I, I want to, in full disclosure, which I think is important, and you've, you've given a lot of full disclosure in, in, in the book I want to talk about mostly, which is diversity. I want to say that... Um, I've been wanting to have you on for a while, but I, of course, I first I first learned of you with the bell curve and all the controversy around the bell curve, and I kind of had a kind of a smug reaction to that. I was kind of happy in a way about the negative responses. I was, um, I was, uh, at the same time, you know, I was I was, cons- you know, being a natural liberal, I was, you know, concerned about that. But I also had a suspicion about social science, being a physicist. 
and therefore a natural skepticism of social science. But at the same time, I have to say, I remember, I mean, at least I think I remember, and a lot of these things are just maybe manufactured memories, some concern. I knew that the blanket com condemnation had to be inappropriate because I, and I, that was even before, that was well before I learned from my own experience in, a, in, a, in the public domain that, that most people don't read anything you write before they condemn it. <laughs> And um, and so yeah. I was I was a little concerned about that. And then um, I also was, you know, I was interested. I was at Harvard and and and, and around the, actually and had moved after Larry Summers had had his experience. But but I, I was impacted by that. And I remember I met him and he I happened to get rid of the president of my university and he, he knew of me because of that. And and uh, and and I was concerned about the reaction to his comments. I didn't once again. It was only later that I realized how innocuous a number of his comments were, uh, and and I began to rethink some of this. But as I say, we come at this. I'm traditionally, and I mean traditionally, and and you make a point in your book. You really, it's hard to have labels nowadays. But I'm traditionally much more liberal. I'm probably left, coming from Canada. By definition, I'm on the left of, uh, in in the states. I think, and uh, in the sense that I don't view, it, intrinsically, I don't view government as the enemy. Um, and um, I think that's a property of parliamentary systems. In any case, so so, and I, you know, I really, and I knew that you, you, as we'll talk about, for good reason, are concerned about to what extent various the implementation of various social programs can really have an effect. But nevertheless, I grew up in Canada with free medical care and lots of social programs, so I, I had that that bias. But things began to change for me. Oh, also, I should say. The fact that you were at AEI also had a bias later on. I actually spoke at AEI, and I don't, I can't remember if we even met there, but I spoke and actually did a dinner at, at the American Enterprise Institute for those people who don't know what it is, which is kind of viewed as a conservative think tank. Um, and I spoke about science nonsense and and um, and non-science um, and religion, and had a dinner afterwards. And I, it was an interesting experience, but I was told later <laughs> that they never wanted me to come back. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, it was, I thought it was an interesting dialogue, oh. but all of that biased me. And then, and then things began to change. I taught at Yale and I, I, uh, during the height of kind of deconstructionism and postmodernism in, in at least the literature departments where everything was viewed as a social construct. And I began to, of course, you know, recognizing that was nonsense, began to rebel about that. And then over the years, as the nonsense of of sort of diversity and equity programs at universities, which I've been intimately involved with for you know, 40 years at universities, seeing how 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 they denied reality and and, and, and clearly things became impossible to talk about or, or generally accepted that were nonsense, that there were no sex differences between men and women, um, that that all disparities in in the number of people in programs was due to white privilege or supremacy. That, which having been clearly been a part of the the situation and observed this, I realized was nonsense. And so, and 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 realizing this this conflating of e uh, misconflating of equality of outcome with equality of opportunity, which are two vastly different things, but are for many people and nowadays for almost all institutions, in, in, at least in America and and in other places, are viewed as the same thing. I began to uh, become more. Uh, interested in trying to learn about what you were talking about. And then finally, you know, having seen cancel culture in many and written about it now a lot, um, I also became more um, sympathetic with the with your quote unquote cancellation because of the bell curve. So I, I wanted to put all that out there because it's going to influence where I'm coming from and, and, and our discussion. So um, I but I don't want to focus We'll talk about the bell curve a little bit. I want to focus, and we talked about this beforehand, with your book, Human Diversity, which is, I will say right off, uh, my work is cut out for me because it's a remarkably comprehensive book. It's a remarkable book in many ways. And um, and uh, and I'm sure I won't do justice, our discussion won't do justice to it because it's quite detailed. I love books that have data, and I'm, that's just the way I am. <laughs> And and this is a book full of data and uh, and uh, to to substantiate points which, as you point out, and we'll get to, are not uh, or should not be subject to debate. And in general, they're generally accepted. 
um, and I mean, in legal parlance, you would say at the beginning of a, you know, these points are not subject to, you know, debate. Um, but I think the the, bulk, the the ultimate theme of that book is that social scientists should be should actually base social science on biology first, and secondly, that biology is having a heyday, that biology is in a golden era, and therefore it's a prime time for social science to be able to exploit the results of biology. Have all of that said in the context of of what is clearly recognizing we live in times where where the denial of the results of biology have become a standard part of at least social well, a lot of social science and a lot of social media. And so um, the book is is talks about the three kind of things you don't want to talk at dinner parties about probably gender, race, and class. And and uh, and we'll talk about and really what I want to go through is is 10 items that you more or less say are are well confirmed and not controversial but they are in modern society so right. before we get there i've been talking nonstop, and and people who often complain i do that um but uh have i misrepresented at least the general context of the book no not at all the the only thing i'd add to that is it was it's really written because i i think the social sciences are well, two things. <clears throat> One, the social sciences will undergo a revolution. And I'm guilty sometimes of being too optimistic about how long a re revolution will take. But I will still go ahead and say what I say in the book, which is I think the, the next 10 years are going to see a lot of the major battles fought uh, because the progress in biology is so rapid at this point. <clears throat> and I'm also saying that, look, it, the social sciences should be embracing that. You talked about a golden age in biology. Social scientists should be relieved that finally we have a chance of being full participants in the scientific project because we've always been second class citizens. The economists sort of have pretensions to higher things. Okay, really but, still but, uh, <laughs> but you know, we're, we're, not, we're not close to what the physicists do. And so we should be really excited and we are. Uh, instead, you have what I think is going to be <clears throat> great turmoil. But I also think at the end of it, and whether it's 10 years or 20 years, doesn't make much difference uh, yeah. in the greater scheme of things. Uh, you will have a social science which is radically different and be attracting radically different people into the field than we have right now. And, uh, and what I'm saying, the way I describe it in the book is, this is a progress report. This is where things stand now. And I know that when you hear these propositions, you're going to say, but that's not true. Everybody knows that it's not true. That's pseudoscience. And I'm saying, actually, no, that the people who are familiar with the literature are going to be yawning and saying, tell me something I don't know. Well, you know, okay, great. In fact, I remember that that specific part, that warning and, and encouragement from the introduction to your book. I I have to say, before we even get there, that I'm I'm surprised by your optimism. <laughs> uh, yeah. In in terms of a time frame, reminds me in my you know in physics experiments, I was involved in proposing things in the 1980s that still haven't been completed. But at the time, I thought it'll all be solved in 10 years. I I I. I, I guess my well, we can talk about this at the end, but I my natural t inclination right now and my what I tell all my friends is that I think it's going to get worse before it's going to get better. But we'll see. Um, well, naturally, I have some thoughts since the book was written that we can get to. Yeah. Good. Oh, that'd be great. Well, let's try and get to it. Um, but before we get to it, uh, this is an origins podcast, and I think it's important to preface some of this, and I was, it was interesting to me as I tried to learn about your life. So I want to ask some questions about your life. Um, you grew up in Iowa, um, and um, and you used to hang around. Ju I re read juvenile delinquents and and um, and pool. and oh, such. Yeah. And um, but your father was an uh, an executive for Maytag. Um, but I don't know what your mother did. I I, I didn't learn. I was going to ask. She was a housewife. She was a housewife. Okay. And you were obviously ended up um, being interested in, well, be, being interested in ideas and, you know, ultimately, you know, go, going to Harvard. But who, who did either of them provide an influence? Speaking of, I know that you've 
talk about in the book, in fact, that sort of the parental influences are not as great as one thinks. But nevertheless, uh, who, did either of them uh, sort of provide an inspiration for what eventually was going to study political science? So I'm wondering, I wondered to know where that came about, that interest. Well, the short answer is uh, my father was a great role model for a, a boy, you know, modest. And it, he was sort of the way that men were supposed to be. He was a very gentle man uh, in the true sense of that word. Well, that's nice. But, you know, ironclad integrity. He didn't go to college because his he had to support his uh, sisters and his parents uh, and uh, he still worked his way up to be the middle manager at uh, Maytag. My mother was a force of nature. Uh, she was a child of a broken marriage, which was not usual in the 1910s when that yeah. happened. Uh, she worked her way through a little college called Culver Stockton and she got a college education all on her own. Oh. Uh, she was a feminist before there were feminists and uh, and she was also, like my father, rock-like integrity and sort of a no exceptions demand of uh, right behavior. And when I disappointed her in that, I remember once she jumped on me uh, for reasons I won't go into uh, when I was 17 years old. And I came out of that experience saying, actually, even when you're 17 years old, your mother can still cow you. <laughs> into, uh, into <laughs> My you know, mother's a hundred and it still happens. <laughs> I don't want to go. I want it's, it's, uh, I've never talked about them before publicly and I've, but, uh, but it wasn't that they had to inspire me to be interested. I was, I wasn't a child prodigy, but you know, all the standardized tests, uh, I was in the top 10th, the top percentile and that sort of thing. And, and I was just interested in everything and read everything and voluminously. Did and, they read? Uh, I, I, I'm, I, did, I mean, it's interesting to me that of the two parents, your mother had gone to college and your father hadn't. Right. But in terms of encouraging reading, uh, did your mother or did it just a natural interest or do you remember? Well, she, I remember that she read to me, you know, uh, and uh, which I enjoyed thoroughly. But uh, she stopped doing that when. I think we were on Huckleberry Finn and she found out that I'd already read two chapters ahead, but I enjoyed listening to her. <laughs> and she said, okay, you can read it yourself now. But uh, yeah, so they encouraged that. It was, it was a very good environment for a kid who was smart in an mm -hmm. IQ sense uh, to flourish uh, because they let me, you know, live at the local Carnegie library. Yeah, sure. Basically. After and school, it was great I to have a library, a great library nearby. You were sm in Newton, Iowa. I, I don't know if I've been to Newton, Iowa. I've been in a lot of places in Iowa, but nah, uh, doubt it, yeah. it's a small town. Small town, fifteen thousand. But, but it had a library and 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 such. Um, did um, now you eventually we'll, we'll get to getting to Harvard in a second, but you 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 you. Stu did you study political science as an undergraduate as well as a uh, graduate student uh, ultimately? No, Russian history. Or, oh, history, Russian that's history. right. Russian, Russian history. history. So yeah. you, you would decide early. I always wonder why people don't do science. So I wanted to ask you. <laughs> I, uh, what, where it's you, where, interesting. Mm -hmm. Because my visual spatial skills uh, charitably can be called pedestrian. <laughs> okay. And uh, so when I was in physics, in high school, just high school physics. Mm -hmm. I didn't do particularly well in it. The, the, uh, the, the ma mathematics was not a language that came naturally to me and still doesn't. And so it wasn't that I wasn't interested in science for any substantive reasons, but I didn't gravitate to it because it did not come easily to me. Whereas things involving history and literature and the rest of that, that was all easy. And I think it's natural for somebody to go with their strengths. Well, yeah, in fact, you talk about that as a, a you legitimize that. It was one of the points in, in, in the latter part of the book, is it? Or actually in the early part of the book, when, when one talks about vocations, uh, that people tend to do what they like. And it's not Which too surprising. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it shouldn't be contentious to suggest that, although it is 
in in a context which we'll get to but it's certainly impact on you so you you were you enjoyed reading and the and and history and obviously history and you studied history and uh you and you said the and i guess i'm interested in your take back and forth on the sats which 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 comes up in this book a little bit but also it's well known that you um said the sats helped you get out of newton and get to harvard because the right. standardized tests but later on you sort of um, argued that they were not um that universities shouldn't use them because of a variety of social changes so you want to talk about that for a second? And I don't know if you've changed that view back again or not. No, no. I, what I said in the article, uh, Lawrence, was uh, I, this was an article in the AEI magazine. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry you didn't have a better experience at AEI. Usually people... Well, I loved better. it. I thought it went really well. It was only afterwards. That... <laughs> anyway. Anyway, yeah. a, a, anyway the, uh, the, the argument was this, and I had to be persuaded by data because I didn't want to believe the data. This was a big California study that was done in the early 2000s. And they concluded that achievement tests do just as good a job, even in schools for disadvantaged kids, as the SAT. And I was saying, that's really hard to believe, you know, because mm -hmm. the SAT, insofar as that, even though it's been bastardized in the last 20 to 5 years, mm -hmm. still is a, is a better measure of G, general intelligence, than than achievement tests, but this California study was very rigorous. And, and also I'm unhappy with the SAT because it has taken on all this cultural baggage. Mm -hmm. And so instead of being this uh, way for a kid from a poor home to be able to raise his hand yeah. and get some attention and say, hey, I, I should be paid attention to, it's become this thing that the kids who get high scores from upper middle class homes flaunt as a, you know, as evidence of their wonderfulness. And if the achievement tests do just as well, achievement tests don't carry a lot of that cultural baggage. So I wanted to replace the SAT with achievement tests. I didn't want to get rid of standardized tests. Yeah, no, that's important because it's, I mean, that's what this is, uh, as you know, there's a huge movement to get rid of standardized testing as, as somehow racist. And um, yeah, I couldn't have imagined. Race, that was... I'm sorry, I, I was saying, Lawrence, I, I, I don't matter. know why. Anyway, yeah, it's racist in the following sense. Uh, it is taking away, well, not so much racist as kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's taking away from them the best tool for identifying them. And that is, that's a crime. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, okay, absolutely. And I, I think, uh, you know, I, I've, I, I go back and forth. I, I, since I went up, grew up in Canada, I didn't take SATs. I think I must have taken some other tests, but universities didn't use them in Canada. It was much less competitive to go to university there than it is in the States, uh, certainly now. Um, but having, it's funny because in physics, um, I've taught at a lot of different schools, uh, elite Ivy League schools and other research universities. And, and it's funny, at least at the graduate level, um, beyond a certain threshold, at least, uh, of competence, uh, I've, I've always found that, uh, that, the, uh, that it's very, that um, the scores really didn't correlate with how well they, people would do, in, in, at least in the, in the, say, the graduate entrance exams. Um, and, uh, and I've always kind of felt been more <laughs> taken with the idea of random acceptance, because um, even at, you know when I left Yale and and, and moved to Case Western, I, I've and then at, even in in Arizona, I, I didn't find we're going to talk about means of distributions, but I didn't find the mean very that different. And they, at the extremes, there were there, you know there were there were huge differences, but most of the students. Um, I've, I haven't found that many differences, and maybe because they're all self-selected middle-class students, I don't know. Well, the numbers on this, there are a lot of numbers, and what you're dealing with is truncation of range yeah, you know, when, yeah. in, your, in your experience. So if you say, is there any evidence that there is a threshold beyond which increments in measured cognitive ability don't make a difference in performance, the answer is no. Uh, that includes the very high end. I, I used to argue with Dick Hernstein about this because I said, look, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I know some kids that had stratospheric IQs and I wouldn't trust them <laughs> to make any kind <laughs> of a common sense decision. Uh -huh. And they were really pretty weird. And, and Dick said, uh, 
I could take you to the admissions office and pull the folders of another dozen kids that were every bit as smart uh, in terms of cognitive ability, but they were also had good social skills. And so you didn't notice them. Uh, <laughs> it's not the case. And, and he had some, he did, he had the data on his side, which was usually true at Dick Bernstein. I see. Well, okay. I don't want to get hung up, but it's interesting to me to see it. Um, you went, you went to the Peace Corps after you in between undergraduate and graduate school. And, and I don't know if that affect, well, if that affect your decision to go into political science, uh, that transition, maybe we could talk about that for a little bit. I want, I do want to get to the book, but I'm intrigued by that. Well, yeah, it's, uh, I can go on a narrative for 20 minutes in that, but I won't. Uh, here's the, here's the Cliff Notes version. I went into Peace Corps because I, from the very beginning, I didn't want to go directly to graduate school. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't. I just didn't like the idea of it. And said, I also wanted to go see the world. And sure. uh, Peace Corps was a good way to do that. And <clears throat> when I was in Peace Corps, and then after I got out of Peace Corps, I stayed in Thailand because at that time, I was married to a Thai woman who had been a Fulbright scholar in the States, and she had an obligation to work off at a local university. So I stayed and I did research projects. Uh, and contrary to what the Southern Poverty Law Center says, these were not uh, covert operate. They, they were research into how to win the hearts and minds of the villagers yeah. and so forth. Anyway, Cliff Notes version, after a couple of years of doing that, I was convinced that my insights into how Thai villages worked were way better than those of the anthropologists I was reading, but I couldn't prove it. Uh -huh. You know, they had their narrative and their anecdotes, and I had my narrative, my anecdotes, and I wanted to be able to prove I was sure. right and they were wrong. And so I got interested in quantitative methods. And I found I, I'm not good at learning math you know, motivating theorems. I'm not good in all sorts of the more abstract things. It turns out I'm pretty good at applying statistical findings. Uh, it certainly seems that way when one reads one. Yeah, you no, know, this this is what I'm good at, and and uh, and so I've, I I pursued that on my own, and then I decided to apply to MIT because uh, they had one of the best programs in quantitative social science. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take every quantitative uh, statistical course known to MIT. And that's pretty much what I tried to do when I got there. That's the advantage of MIT. I always felt, and you know, I know people in the humanities and social sciences at MIT, and I've always admired, admired that quantitative aspect. I remember it was a big jump when I went from across down the river from MIT to Harvard to see that change a little bit. Um, yep. Now, yeah, but you, you did, you know, actually I was, I was amused reading that your wife, um, your your next wife, your wife who's a Quaker. By the way, from Newton, Iowa. Did that mean women? I saw that. I thought, did you know each other as 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 children, or was that just a fluke? Two and a half blocks away from each other. Our parents were good friends. I was six years older than she, so I had no interest in her whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. At that age, no. eighteen and twelve, yeah, <laughs> which yeah, just aren't interested. Yeah. And we reconnected uh, when we were both in our thirties. That's and lovely. That's a lovely together. story. That's great. And, and, and I, I think, uh, you know, she was, I, I, this is one of the things, cause I've, I've heard from people who I know what a nice man you are. Let me put it that way. And, and, uh, and I was amused, but her reaction was, was, I, I think the same as a lot of other people must be about you, which is, she said, you know, she looked at your conservative reading list and was, a, you know, and was sort of, turned off by it, but ultimately had a hard time reconciling that with the deep decency you had as a human being. And I thought that was a beautiful, a beautiful combination. And, um, well, and I just, and, and everything, uh, you know, uh, that, that I can just reading you, I, 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 I can see both. And I think that's really kind of a nice combination. So she, I'm, I'm happy that has worked out, but I will just say that she, uh, we were courting when I was working on losing ground. And so she began her role as editor. She has oh. edited everything I published. Oh, wow. And uh, she's a brilliant editor. And, but as she was doing, she was still a standard academic liberal when she yeah. was uh, doing this. And, and sometimes she caught herself saying, I'm helping this guy write better positions that uh, I'm supposed to find horrific. 
that is the that is that is the best thing i mean that's that's why i love that that's why i want these conversations it's that kind of that's what so should be so wonderful about academia in general exactly. and is completely missing now and and that's yep. what d- depresses me and and it's important for me to have conversations across the, well for me personally as an individual but also to try and promote these discussions because um, you don't have to agree with someone to have an interesting discussion, and 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 that's wonderful. That and it's wonderful that your relationship survived that and has continued to survive that. She's, I understand, a Quaker. That may make um, some some uh, some uh, relevance there. And and the last thing I want to say because I want to come back to this at the end of the discussion, five hours from now. No, anyway, at the end of the discussion. Um, you're you described yourself as an agnostic, you sort of a, a Christian wannabe. But you really can't jump. Is that still true? Yeah. Oh no. I. Well, yeah. In a way. Um, I mean, I've evolved uh, over the last fifteen years a lot under my wife's influence, and also the people I met through her, and also through other people. So I'm afraid you would find me disturbingly uh, shaky in my unbelief uh, if we talked about it longer. Uh, I'm still. filled with uncertainties about all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been tending toward uh, being religious and specifically Christian. Well, you know, it, it, as Fox Muldar said in the, in the X-Files, we, you know, we all want to believe. And so I think it's understandable. And I was going to say, I'll help you in, in your, in, get over your shakiness, but I, I, but I'm not a <laughs> proselytizing atheist in fact, but uh, I think, uh, one thing I will point out is I edited a book. I, no, I didn't edit. I actually wrote the preface for an old book that was re coming out about atheism, and it made a point which, which I'd never thought of before, which is agnosticism is atheism. If if you take if you take atheism generally saying is well you're not willing to, uh, to not doubt, <laughs> in a sense you're not willing to you don't find the arguments convincing enough to say yeah I quote unquote believe. Which is what agnostic is that that's just a one form of atheism, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. I think that it's important that we have questions, but I can understand um, the attraction of at least the so the, the certainly the Quaker aspect of Christianity. Anyway, we'll come back to that because I think it's um, you end your book in, 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 in discussing that maybe you don't remember you ended the book, but n- not really, but it, I picked up on it uh, on on the need to um, well, when we get to when we get to the uh, the goals of how to have a good society, but let's 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 get to the book. But I think that all of that was fascinating for me anyway, and I, and I was very happy that you revealed some at least one thing that you'd never said before. So that was good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, okay. So human diversity is a book about literally uh, the, the nature of human diversity as it relates primarily to those three conceptual areas of gender, um, class, uh, race, and class. And um, and you begin by 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 talking about the 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 fact that um, uh, on university campuses you can't really um, uh, incorporate biology into social science without being inconspicuous. That the the and I'm intrigued. But you said the price can be protest by students, denial of tenure, tenure track employment for post sorry denial of tenure track employment for postdocs, denial of tenure for assistant professors, or reprimands from the university administrators. You're being very tame. It actually includes even more than that. You can now be, you can now have your tenure, tenure revoked. Tenure is no longer what it used to be. And I know of a number of examples that I've written about in the Wall Street Journal elsewhere. People, where people um, basically who, who, um, who disagree, are, are, are they're, free, they're they're removed from tenure. So it's it's gotten more extreme, I think. Than it's it's awful. Now here are let let me read. Maybe it's probably best to read the ten. Uh, items that are that are not in dispute. If if I if I was going to be a judge, I would say that um, that or that you, you would argue are not in dispute. Could not be in dispute. Yeah. yeah. One is sex differences in personality are consistent worldwide and tend to widen in more gender egalitarian cultures. Two, on average, females worldwide have advantages in verbal ability and social cognition, while males have advantages in visuospatial abilities and the extremes of mathematical ability. Three. On average, women worldwide are are more attracted to vocations centered on people 
and men to vocation centered on things. Already I, I can hear listeners screaming, but anyway. Um, four, many sex differences in the brain are coordinated with sexual differences in personality, abilities, and social behavior. Five, human populations are genetically distinctive in ways that correspond to self-identified race and ethnicity. Six, evolutionary selection pressures since humans left Africa have been extensive and mostly local. Seven, continental population differences and variants associated with personality, abilities, and social behavior are common. Eight, the shared environment usually plays a minor role in explaining personality, ability, and social behavior. Nine, class structure is importantly based on differences in abilities that have substantial genetic component that have a substantial genetic component. And 10, outside interventions are inherently constrained in the effects they can have on personality, abilities, and social behavior. So, so I want to go through those one by one. I've highlighted for myself some quotes, but I want to give you a chance to, well, an opportunity to, to elaborate. Um, obviously, as I say, we can't do justice because the, mo most of this is trying to argue that there's substantial data supporting these things. And now we can... We can assert that on this on this program, but we can't. Uh, 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 you, there may be examples, but it'd be hard to adequately uh, 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 re reproduce the data that you have there. Um, but but you do recognizing that these ten things, as you point out, will are either people will have order stop reading the book, or they'll just say, um, you know, if they're experts, we knew these things. You do you do feel the need right away to say, let me state explicitly that I reject claims that groups of people be they sexes or races or classes, can be ranked from superior to inferior. I reject claims that differences among groups have any relevance to human worth or dignity. And so um, I think, you know, that's a disclaimer. I think given the, 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 um, the bad rap you have that you had to do. But let's begin um, with the sex differences, with, with gender. Sex differences in personality consistent worldwide tend to widen more gender uh, egalitarian cultures. Um, your basis for this first is with evolution, which I, I, I resonate with the fact that, you know, evolution leads to sex differences in tribes. First of all, physiologically, men are larger, faster, greater bo upper body strength. Females are capable of gestation and lactation. And given such differences, certain divisions of labor were natural. And so, so that, that was an initiation of biology being, having an impact on, on, um, on uh, uh on but, but, personality actually, and, and mm -hmm. can i correct something here sure um, sure yeah if you're asking do i think that evolutionary psychology it plays it should play a huge role in all of this the answer is yes but as i was doing the the work on the book i was dismayed to find that every time you invoke uh, an evolutionary psychological explanation uh, that the retort, oh, this is a just so story that these reactionaries have made up to justify the patriarchy and so forth. They were dismayingly effective. Mm -hmm. And so I explicitly say in the introduction, I'm not going to talk about evolutionary biology. Yeah. I'm going to talk about, because of that very reason, I'm going to focus on what we know about what is, whatever the sources of the causes of that may be. So I agree with what you just said about the role of evolution, but that's not. Yeah, no. In not fact, my, I'm glad uh, you, you jumped in because you do okay. say that explicitly. That that, uh, and you do, and what you also say in the end of the book is that you think that's a field that's going to blossom because of the yeah. ability to uh, to because of improvements in genetics, primarily that evolutionary psychology will be able to be correlated with genetic factors in a way that, in in your in your hope, will bloom greatly in the next ten to twenty years. Okay, so. Um, uh, so you give a framework for thinking about sex, sex differences and, um, um, uh, um, uh, and, and, so and of course, talk about difference between gender and sex. Sorry, go on. Uh, let me just give a, maybe the, the way to do this is let's go through each of the 10, mm -hmm. but for some of them, I will try to be real brief because a, I can't go through all the evidence sure. for it, but I can summarize quickly why. I think we can dispose of it in the case of the first proposition that uh, that these these differences in personality and so forth are found worldwide and they tend to widen in the most uh, uh, socially and, and uh, gender egalitarian countries. 
that's a case of we have replication after replication, point number one. I think I had three or four at the time I was writing the book. There have been more that have come out since then. Point number two is there are no countervailing studies out there of similar quality, remotely similar quality, that find the opposite, a narrowing of these differences. And point number three is that in the current environment, this is an unwelcome finding. So you know very well that an awful lot of the scholars who went into this uh, went into it expecting to find that the differences narrow in more gender egalitarian societies probably were not happy to find that they didn't. Bless their hearts, they went ahead and published the data anyway. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, we're talking about a finding that's extremely consistent and uh, has lots of replications and is sort of hostile testimony. But let me give a real quick example of why it works that way. Okay. Why it can be this uh, that uh, differences in, let's say, vocational preferences uh, are more gender typical in Sweden than mm -hmm. they are in Pakistan. And this may be intuitively understandable. If you are a woman who is capable of being an engineer in Pakistan, you are capable of taking up a profession that pays pretty well. And there are not that many you don't have an abundance of opportunities if you're a woman in Pakistan to get a job that has good pay. So you may not want particularly to be an engineer, but the incentives to do so are compelling. If you are that same woman with exactly that same skill set in Sweden, uh, you do have abundant choices. And so you don't have to go with the one or two that will make a decent income for you. You can go with a wide variety of choices and you can afford to do what you want to do. And so the implication is that the reason that the differences widen in some respects is because in the more gender egalitarian countries, people have greater freedom, uh, have more latitude to do what comes naturally. I will just interject a little caveat to that, 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 though, just to let people know how interesting this is. A great deal of what accounts for the widening differences is, is men, not women. That in some ways, men show more tendency to have gender typical choices uh, in more gender egalitarian countries, which I find very interesting. And I don't have a quick snappy explanation for that. You know, it's always nice to find something that surprises one. That's why I like doing physics. But, but uh, okay, let's let's parse this a little bit. Um, okay, that's a summary, and mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important. I, I think it's important. If you don't, we won't do it. But but to stress when one is talking about these studies, one's talking about statistics, and to try and and when one looks at the analyses and the studies that have been done one refers to things like effect size. And I, th you know, I, I think for people wondering how you, one can make those statements quantitatively, it might be useful for you to spend a few minutes talking about distributions and effect size. I think it's probably sure. worthwhile. And because it also gets to a central, central source of arguments about the argument about the magnitude of gender differences. Mm -hmm. uh, effect sizes are usually fairly small. One of the things, effect size means, uh, let's say that you have uh, uh, the effect of nutrition on height. Uh, yes, it does have an effect, but uh, it's not huge. It's, it's relatively small in any one generation. And that's true of, of most social phenomena. Let, let, things... let me interrupt you for one second, only maybe because I like to think mathematically, but I want, but it's important since, and maybe it's too bell curvish, but but um, but to measure it, basically, one is looking at two dist everything is a distribution. People are distributed and normally by some normal curve, which has a peak somewhere. And and generally what the studies are doing are looking at the distributions. And they're always outliers in both directions for men, women and, and everything else is looking at the difference uh, 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 of the between the two peaks divided by the width of the distribution. If the, clearly, if, the, if they're, you're going you're gonna to draw it. Oh. Can, I can't. Uh, I can't uh, I, uh, can you no, see no, this? No, I'm seeing the top uh, of your Okay, book. never mind. Uh, no, it's no, all right, this, but this, let this, me, this, I, I can just say it. So if, if two distributions are really narrow and they're, dis, and, and they're far, and the peaks are far apart, it's clearly 
the case. If the, if the peaks are the same distance apart, but the distributions are very wide, then you might argue you can't really distinguish them. So effect size is really the distance between those peaks divided by the width of the distribution. So one can heuristically, so I, I just want, I think it's important because that's a central factor in a lot of the analyses that, that you talk about. And it's a, it's a reasonable way of trying to understand if statistically what you're seeing is, 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 is visible. Uh, I, I used to, a friend of mine, who, I mean, a physicist used to say that if, if you really needed complex statistics to see differences, then they probably weren't there. But, but it, with effect size, if you, if you can, if, it's basically, if you can see it, it's there. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thing that I've, I've spent 25 years trying to get people to understand overlapping distributions. Sure. And the other aspect of it is uh, not only is the distance between the two, two peaks oftentimes small, what that means is that there's a great deal of overlap. Yeah. So you do not have people separated into binary camps. Yeah. One other quick point though, and this is where I have taken a side in a very contentious uh, topic. If you take each you know, personality, characteristic and cognitive ability and social behavior separately and say, what are the effect sizes between men and women the answer is most of them are, are small. And those who say that it's wrong to think that these differences are a big deal like to deal with them one at a time. And another set of scholars say, oh, you can't do that, that if you have uh, 15 personality characteristics, what you're interested in is a profile. And so each of the individual effect sizes can be small but there are ways of aggregating those and you aggregate them and uh, you've got an important difference. I am persuaded that you cannot look at these things separately if they are conceptually related as they are conceptually related. So yeah, of course one has to, and, and one sees this in fields like physics where one can do, of course, statistics much easier, more easily. You have to worry about the correlations between them. Clearly if yeah. two things are completely correlated, you can't just add them because they're basically saying, telling you yeah. the same thing. Yeah. So one has to look for independence and correlations and, and, and all these things are, are carefully accounted for if you do the statistics properly. But, but it's really important to, if you're aggregating to say, are these 15 factors independent or are they all really the same thing? And, yeah. and... But, but, but there are techniques for doing that. Yeah, sure. Exactly. And you talk about it uh, in, 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 in the book. And that's one of the many things we won't, we won't get to. One of the things you said before we get on to, you know, this personality differences, and you've sort of said that, and I'd like, I'd really like to get to the, the um, verbal and mathematical and, and vocational differences, because that's kind of really a hot topic and one that, that, Let's do that. I've written about. Um, but I will, I, I can't help but giving one quote about a day, a, a, a fact about sex difference of personality that I didn't know that so I want to say it that I read in your book, because for other people, the most dramatic example of a finding from infancy, which led to co considerable publicity, was a 2002 study presenting evidence that newborn girls no more than two days old after birth showed stronger interest in a human face, while the newborn boys showed stronger interest in a mechanical mobile. It's a, it's a single unreplicated study with a sample of 102, not proof to take the bank, but its finding was in line with many other studies. I, I think it's fascinating to see more and more studies that are looking at these things um, and and finding um, um, you know as you say with 102 kids it's not it's not uh, anything to fit it but it's intriguing to me and I, and yeah, I was surprised. yeah I, I, I agree with you and and the reason I don't I said don't take that to the bank but you have a, but that's dramatic because it's only you know they're just a day or two old but you also have a lot of studies that are with children a month or two old uh, and so, so the chance for the environment to be accounting for things is still quite limited. So once again, we're looking at a pattern of results that are consistent. Okay, let's 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 talk to the about the about the neural functioning, neurocognitive functioning, visuospatial, and math. I mean, this is the the hot topic area. This is the area that got Larry Summers fired, and a long time ago, or at least uh, just removed. I don't. Well, maybe fired is the right way to say it. Um, so and and it's an area of interest to me because lately one's seeing the the these requirements in in stem fields that that um that are 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 suggesting um, 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 
forced requirements that that seem that seem uh, to me and I've written to be not only ridiculous but harmful. And um, and and so let's go right to math uh, but first before we go to visual spatial. And you say um, um, uh, and you say it's one of the cases in which data are plentiful and the story doesn't vary at least within the United States. Sex differences in mathematics become progressively larger as the sample becomes more selective and the type of math skill becomes more advanced. And, uh, and your examples here were fascinating to me. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, partly you have a difference in male and female uh, variants. Uh, so that even if the mean is relatively close in terms of, of uh, math tests, that you have more males at the, you know, at the low end, but you also have more males at the high end. And the further out you get, the greater the disproportion becomes. So what becomes a minor difference at the means uh, is important because you have radically different proportions of males and females who are out at the far end. How do we know that's true, particularly uh, given that in order to do confident work at the far ends of distributions need really big sample sizes. Sure. But, but this is a case where we do have that in the form of this, you know, uh, US math competition, the name of which I'm forgetting, but it's a very difficult, uh, it's sort of like the SAT math on steroids. And, uh, and, and the, the male female differences in that are very large. And you say, the well, MC12, I think you call it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, uh, math and so mm -hmm. the sample, we have a number of samples with reasonably large samples, uh, sizes. Uh, you still have to worry about some self selection problems. You know, might it be that women are less interested in taking that test because of social pressures not to, uh, you know, be in math? Uh, so I'm not saying those are dispositive. I'm saying they're consistent across measures. But I'll tell you what I find um, if you if, if we're segueing into vocational choices. Yeah. And the really fascinating data there is the, the, the data set for the uh, study of mathematically precocious youth. Uh, I found, I found that data wide. remarkable. So I was going to get there, but we can jump there now. Yeah. Okay. Let's well, go there. If we're going to get through all 10, I think we've got to move briskly. Oh along yeah. Well, 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 yeah, but I wanted to go through. Yeah. I, I plan to more, more intensively do the beginning and, 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 beca and, and more generally towards the end, but it's okay. Well, okay. I want, I want to brisk it go, but I, I do want to, before I was actually going to go right there, but I did want to, one thing that I think is important that you point out is that there are other areas where there are the same uh, effect size differences that, that work in the other direction that women in, in, have better spa social cognition and, um, and, um, uh, and uh, and I think verbal abilities, but uh, so so that so there are similar tests that you can perform for that. Yeah, and there, well, there's there's uh, the neurocognitive tests of the Penn, the University of Pennsylvania cohort, where uh, they have a battery of tests where you have very interesting different profiles for men and women, but there is no way in which you can look at those profiles and say oh, guys are smarter than gals or, or vice versa because of you've got these different strengths. And when we get to advances in neuroscience, the nice conjunction is that they're making progress in understanding why these things uh, exist. Some of the data that I find most interesting, again, are, are studies that can be criticized and I'm not using as the basis for my conclusions, mm -hmm. but there's a thing, you know, this test called uh, reading the mind in the eyes. And it consists of a set of photographs of just a rectangle of the eyes. Uh, and this is about all you see. And you're supposed to identify from multiple choice what that person's emotions are and so forth. And I took the test uh -huh. and I, I took I, the I, test and I and I I took it very seriously, and I spent time on it. I stared at them. Uh, okay, I've been saying before my IQ is above average. My score on reading the mind in the eyes was precisely average for males. Okay, 
and uh, it's lower than the, the, the one for females. So, you know, you have the stereotype of women who, and this is the kind of thing, oh, women are intuitive and so mm. forth, or intuitive, which the feminists are very unhappy about because, uh, you know, the, the, the men are rational and have intellectual power, but women have this kind of cute intuition. No, it's not that women observe what's going on in the world around them and they can decode information and some things better than, than men can decode it. And uh, there's a lot of consistent data to that effect. Oh, sure. I, and anecdotal. I certainly by the way, there's lots of uses, uh, very exactly. unsentimental ones too. It means, for example, women may very well be better interrogators in criminal the situations yeah, that sure. men are because they're picking up on things that men don't pick up on. Can, uh, there are a wide variety of applications of these social cognition skills. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, by the way, did your wife take the test? Uh, did you, did, did she, did you, you know, I never got her to take it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my, but, well, I might as well fess up. She scores higher on all kinds of standardized tests. Yeah, tests. sure. Okay. <laughs> good. Good. Then good. Excellent. Um, but okay, but now we'll get, let's get to the vocational part of this because it it really resonates with something that 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 is very a very important social issue for me anyway for, in academia, which is this issue of diversity. And you, you started by saying people generally enjoy things they're good at, like you talked about why you went to history. They also like the experience of being good at what they do. A fundamental truth about the nature of human enjoyment that goes back to Aristotle. And and when it comes, we're living in times where there there is there are differences between the proportion in a, not just in gender but in race in of 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 individuals in university departments and background demographics and and what what we're told without any evidence without any studies without any supporting empirical data is that that's due to racism or systemic racism and um and I think you make the point very clearly at the beginning that more than a century after legal restrictions on women's vocations were lifted, and a half century since gender discrimination and hiring, promotion of firing were outlawed, large disparities continue to exist in university education that young men and women attain the jobs and the jobs they take. And we'll see that if the, the disparities go in two different directions, in different directions, in different areas. But you can see it. I, again, I, I've said this in other podcasts. I was a chairman of a department in the 1990s, and a, and um, and I, you know, I, I saw how even then, if we we were working hard to to, to get women in, in, into physics departments, and every time we made a hire that wasn't a woman, I always had to write a letter explaining why. And that was 30 years ago. And so it's not as if this stuff is new now, but we're still seeing disparities. And I think the the this study that you Let's talk about these studies, which I just think are fascinating at the extremely high levels. This guy named Julian Stanley had the idea back in the 1970s uh, or 60s to give the SAT to 13 year olds. Mm -hmm. And the idea was uh, that it's just this regular SAT. And so a lot of the stuff in the SAT is on subjects that, that kids haven't even been taught at the age 13, but it will identify extreme levels of talent. And it was a brilliant idea and it worked. And he had uh, a program which identified these kids and they also had summer camps for them and a variety of things. But in addition to that, they had longitudinal follow-ups. And so you have good sized, large samples uh, that go back to children that were born in the 1960s and have been followed ever since. And remember what I said earlier about the difficulty of studying the high end is you need big sample sizes of people who are out of that. They've got that. Mm -hmm. Here are the two best things of all. Uh, the first is that you now have a set of males and females going into college and choosing careers for whom any differences in skill sets are in a sense irrelevant because all of these kids just about are capable of pursuing any occupation that they want to pursue. Uh, notice it's the study of mathematically precocious youth. So yeah. you have very high math skills among the women too. That's one good thing. And yeah, yeah. The I mean, the, these, are, these, are, these are different cohorts which are truly exceptional math skills and yep, they're, and they're, and they're top, you know, and they're percentile. good. And they're females and males and uh, uh, both being studied. And again, just to emphasize, being studied from the time they're young 
to when they're in their 50s. So which is really uh, wonderful. I, I did not know. It's just, it just seems to me a dream study for social scientists. The, the second, well, the second big advantage of the sample, and this may come as a surprise to people who still think that feminism is a new phenomenon. There was probably more intense socialization in the upper middle class uh, of gender neutrality in the 1970s than there is now. Yeah. Uh, that was the decade when women can have it all. That was the decade when men need, uh, women need men like a fish needs a bicycle, to a uh, common mm -hmm. phrase. Yeah, when, him, the, uh, when, when gender neutral toys were already a big thing. And the kids who ended up taking these tests in the uh, SIMPI program were drawn from Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Baltimore area, and overwhelmingly from these upper middle classes that were already fanatically uh, trying to socialize their, their daughters into being interested in this stuff. So you, you have a really terrific sample, and here's what you found out. Well, here is a little tiny bit of all the fascinating things they, they found out. One is that, uh, that people, even at that very high end, tend to go with what they do well. And that includes males who uh, had higher verbal skills than math skills. They tended to go toward, toward uh, verbally oriented occupations. And women who had, uh, they followed the same pattern, except that women who clearly could, well, first place, there are more women than men who had the very high verbal skills in these sets. Mm -hmm. And they, in a way, males have fewer choices than females do at the high end, because with an awful lot of the females in this program, their math and their verbal were both in the top percentile. Mm -hmm. Whereas you had a fair number of the guys who were absolutely brilliant at math and hopeless at verbal, or at least not nearly as strong. I don't suppose you ever met anybody like that in the physics department. <laughs> uh, but in a lot of ways, yes. most of the extremely mathematically talented guys were going to go into STEM because that's what they were good at and they would go mm -hmm. to it. Whereas you had a lot of women who could have gone either way in terms of their skills, and they tended to go toward the, uh, uh, toward the verbally or people-oriented courses. And what I what I found more interesting, even more well, that reinforced that more was that there were two cohorts there. There were the merely exceptional cohort two, yeah. which is sort of in the top one percent, and then there was a cohort that was just off scale in the point one percent level uh, and beyond. Uh, I, you know, I, IQs whether you like it or not, at you know at one eighties or something, and and um, and the effect was almost stronger. In the, in the cohort that was even more exceptional. Yeah, I know. And that that was very intriguing to me. I should say, by the way, just again for full disclosure, I grew up and I'm the child of the '60s. I was born in the '50s, and so what you're talking about is that that sensibility in in urban environments of 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 uh, of, of that age of feminism is something that I grew up with, and it was exactly that that everyone that you know everyone was capable of everything, and women were you know, w w should be, the, the sky should be the limit. And it's really interesting for me to see, having had that sensibility to see the, um, the, vic the, vic the victimhood card that's being played a lot. But let, let me, let me, and I know I'm, I'm pushing people's buttons. I'm expecting lots of hate uh, responses for some of this, but, but let me, but you know, I would expect, on. what? There's lots of data on this. Yeah, you know? there's lots of data. That's what's amazing. And and the and I and I encourage people to look at the book and other things for data because data matters. And but you, I just read the book and you wrote it a long time ago. So I want to quote some things here that may not be in the top of your head here. But um, cohort two was remember remind you the, the the listener that or viewer that that that's just the merely exceptional, the top one percent uh, in this uh, math test. Uh, educationally, males and females in cohort two were in a dead heat with nearly the same high proportion of getting bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Yet the traditional gender gap in STEM majors persisted. The, 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 these women were about twice as likely to take STEM majors as the general population of female undergraduates. But this was also true of the men and the male-female ratio in STEM degrees was, was about 1.6, even in that sample. So once again, they were more because they were incredibly skilled. They were more likely to go into scam, but but 
but men were still more likely in that in, the, in that uh, group. Um, uh, um, even though everyone in core two was gifted in math skills, those with those whose verbal skills were even higher than their math skills, namely who were even more talented verbally, ended up in the social sciences, humanities, business, and law, while those whose math skills were greater than their verbal skills tended to end up in STEM fields, reinforcing the notion that, that you like you do what you like to do. And if you're stronger in one area than the other, you do it. Um, and um, then, then, then you talk about the top, this final group, which is one in 10,000 individual level. Um, and uh, even gifted women who are attracted to STEM gravitate towards the life sciences, you point out, not math and the physical sciences. It's a subtle tendency. Proportionally, males outnumbered females by almost two to one on the things oriented sciences. That means physics, mathematics, engineering, and females outnumbered males by almost two to one in the people-oriented sciences like life sciences, biology, and et cetera. Um, the, the implication you say are women are who are so gifted that they can deal with any intellectually demanding field are not scared off by science per se. They instead tend to prefer those fields that deal with living things rather than non-living things. And I thought that was a, um, an interesting point. Uh, anything, you want, did I, did anything you want to add to that? Uh, the, the only thing I would add is that did the feminist revolution in the 1970s have any effect? The answer is yes, it did. You did have a lot of vocational changes and vocational patterns in the 1970s, including an increase of women going into STEM fields. The interesting thing is that these increases, which I think were directly the result of opening up of opportunities, had stabilized very quickly. They stabilized by the late 1980s or early 1990s in most cases. And they've now been pretty stable for 30 years. That's important. And, um, and, and so here is circumstantial evidence, but it seems to me that because you did observe the initial change, which is environmental, uh, that the fact that it stabilized in the last 30 years indicates that a burden of proof has shifted somewhat. So that uh, if you're going to say it's still because of race, uh, sexism that women aren't doing this stuff, okay, you can try to make that case, but you gotta make the case. You can't just assert it. You can't assert it. And th that's what's really important. And that's, that's what resonates and why I, I think I become involved in this a little bit is that I've been a part of it. And I've watched how it's, you know, this, diversity push is not new and then in the 90s as i say we were you know 30 years ago and, and even the 80s but 90s by the time i was chair of a department uh, early 90s we, we were working very very hard and there was a huge effort to to try and um recruit uh women and minorities and 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 it's not new and the notion that somehow that it has to be legislated now 30 years later that somehow universities were systemically barring women from fields 30 years ago. Well, that was true 50 years ago, as you're pointing out, but it wasn't true 30 years ago. And it hasn't, and the fact that, that the numbers, as you quote them, haven't changed much is very interesting, uh, a very interesting point. And I think it, it's, it's quite telling. And, and, uh, and you make the point also that you can also see this difference and it, 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 it go in the other direction. That the, that the removal of barriers for women has not only increased the number of women in STEM, but, it, but it's increased the number of women in education to the point that right now, women at higher educations outnumber men by a huge factor. Most universities, it's 60% women, 40% men. And, and, uh, and, um, and he, I think that and you quote this number, 1960, 20 men got a professional degree for every woman who did because it was legislated, the women were excluded. By 1970, the ratio was less than 10 to one. By 1980s, it was less than three to one. In 2005, it became equal, women caught up with men. Since then, more women have gotten more professional degrees than men every year. Um, as of 2016, 93,000 and change, women got professional degrees compared to 84,000 for men. And, um, and, and, uh, and that continues. Um, uh, um, and uh, so that, in fact, more, more PhDs, women are getting more PhDs than men uh, in universities. And so the notion that universities are systemically 
um, uh, uh, infringing on the education of women generally certainly can't be made. Yeah, and and uh, the notion that uh, the fathers of these daughters uh, have been, or the mothers have been, telling them to uh, oh get married and have babies and don't get that that's not true either. Uh, the the encouragement of women to go into all sorts of fields has been coming from home as well as from the universities. And I think the other important point that really uh, is worth stating is that is the global nature of this. The fact one can argue it's a societal thing and one can argue that they're social factors as people do, but it is fascinating that that there's a global consistency in the numbers. They're almost they're 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 very stable um, from all countries. Um, the relative strength effect size of math for for boy, for boys versus girls, young young kids is 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 pretty stable in 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 um in most countries and on average women worldwide are more attracted to vocations centered on people and men to vocations centered on things and in fact i think the point you make is that though that difference is in is larger in societies that are more egalitarian where you would think there are fewer barriers um to, for women going into stem for example but i just add to why sure. do we think this is a problem yeah. that, that more women, if they go into the sciences, go into biology or they go into if they're going into medicine, that more women go into uh, direct patient care as opposed to surgery? Come on. This is not something that we need to lose sleep over. On the contrary, you know what? The idea that you have lots of very mathematically talented women who are going into let's say the people-oriented social sciences, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Uh, in, in all cases, why don't we relax and say, let's declare victory. Let's say we have made enormous progress in allowing men and women alike to fulfill their potential in the way that they see fit. It, 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 I, I, obviously, I couldn't agree more. And, I, and, and it's even... I'd add to that by saying it not only should we not relax, but what is incredibly sad is you take environments like university, there are no more enlightened environments, or there used to be no more enlightened environments in, in, in the world, and certainly in America um, and, and the West, than universities. Where, and, and, and that level of enlightenment and that level of open, open encouragement has been around for a long time, but instead, what we're seeing is the is the claim of the exact opposite, that that uh, they are 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 systemically biased, that 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 they're that they're unsafe, that uh, and 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 those are the reasons that that there are these disparities, and it's sort of it's so it's it's tragic for me as as someone who's been in academia to see an environment where. Not only is that claim made, but if you disagree with that claim now, you are you are ostracized. Yeah, uh, agreed. Yeah. Okay. Well, We've let's go got, to the next We've claim, which is that, to do. what was that? We've only got eight more to do. Yeah, I know, but we're going to go faster. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. It's uh, it, because a lot of this, the arguments, the basic setting up the arguments is somewhat similar. And so I was thinking, you know, as I was reading, I was thinking, well, okay. When, you know, it, when we get to race, you're right, it'll be a different kind of, it's a historical argument, but, but I do want to get to the sex differences in the brain briefly, um, which is, uh, I guess, um, many uh, uh, sex differences in the brain are coordinated with sex difference, sex differences in personality. The fact that, that uh, again, what seems to be a heretical statement, but should simply be viewed as a fact on the basis of neuroscience, is that men's and women's brains are, are different, and there are, there are measurable biological causal factors having to do with hormonal effects that produce that. So why don't you, why don't you just quick briefly? There are a wide variety of, of differences that have been identified. <clears throat> Everything from different volumes, uh, relative volumes of the brain in men and women uh, to different actual total volumes. You have a variety of specific things that have done with, been done with different regions of the brain. I'm not gonna go into those, they're fascinating. But I will go with the one thing that I certainly wasn't familiar with, and I imagine a lot of people watching aren't either. When I thought about the role of testosterone, that yeah. famous hormone, 
I've thought about it in terms of the it's circulating as a drug and, and you know and it has yeah. effects like alcohol has yeah. or whatever and and it does have those effects and they are important uh they have all sorts of behavioral effects and because men have higher levels of testosterone they they affect sex differences what i did not know was that you have uh prenatally these surges of testosterone that affect that they bind with uh with certain parts of the brain and certain receptors of the brain mm -hmm. among males uh and not among females who develop normally and they change fundamentally the structure of the brain or the functioning of the brain and in particular the links to the lateralization of the brain are very strong uh, whereby lateralization means basically insofar as a brain is lateralized that means that one of the hemispheres of the brain is doing a whole lot of work separately from the other one and insofar as it's not lateralized both sections of the brain are are operating in, in greater coordination and there is not really an argument among neuroscientists that male brains are lateralized much more than female brains and that it is a direct result of the uh, testosterone surges prenatally that uh, bind with receptors in the brain. I have, I'm having to simplify all of this very greatly. This also it can explain uh, the visual spatial skill difference between males and females for reasons I won't go into except mm. think in terms of suppose you have one part of the brain that is optimized for efficiency in visual spatial skills and in males more than in women and the other thing is say suppose you have a brain in which the two hemispheres communicate uh, and are not lateralized the former can explain why you have uh, elevated visual spatial skills in males the latter can explain such things as for example if you have an injury to the left hemisphere i hope i'm not mixing up left and right at this point i always have problems with left we'll and just right. say we're interviewing um, you in a mirror it's okay <laughs> yeah uh, but 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 if, if uh, males suffer a damage to the left hemisphere their language function is screwed and they are very unlikely to uh, get it back again whereas women it's much easier for women with exactly the same kind of injury to just simply shift the load to the other uh, other hemisphere and recover which is better you know, it depends on what you what, what your criterion doing? measure is. And that's true with just about everything involving differences in the male female brain. It is not good versus bad. It is it depends on what you want to optimize. Absolutely. And and you know, and and uh and you remind me with lateralization, my wife always reminds me that I'm not good at multitasking because I have such a small corpus callosum that 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 you know which connects <laughs> which which connects the two halves of the brain and so we have a teeny one so she she says oh, i'll forgive you because you have a tiny corpus callosum and uh but it is true it's that nice that, that is oh yeah and and well she certainly knows those things and and, and uh can try and understand every now and then um but it is true in fact uh and i was happy to see the data in your book that 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 connector if you wish between the two hemispheres is measurably larger on average on average again their distributions in women than men and and even the, even in in infants um I, just the last bit before we move on to the next subject one one quote i took from here which i thought was fascinating we found that at toddlers at at 12 and 24 months of age who had we had identified as having lower fetal testosterone now at higher levels of eye contact and a larger vocabulary or putting the other way around, the higher level of prenatal testosterone, the less eye contact you now make and the smaller your vocabulary. I mean, so these, when you're seeing it in kids, it's just really quite amazing. And I think, um, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that is that that is fascinating and in some ways should be celebrated as part of human diversity and the wonder of being, of, of being male or female. But um, mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, as you say, there's to put a value judgment on whether being better at mechanical things or you know better at being able to communicate or at, or or relate socially, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And again, 
as you stress in the book, and I want to stress over and over again, these are statistical statements. Every individual, and, and, and I think it's really important, and one of the things that I know recently a, I wrote about, a faculty member didn't get a scholarship, didn't get a, a, a grant in Canada, a physicist, because more or less he said, I treat everyone as an individual. It was his diversity statement. And I, and I, you know, and I look at their skills, and that was obviously not good. But that's exactly what all of this suggests, is that sure, there are statistical means and averages and changes, but every individual has skills and talents that are different and have to be treated as individuals and very important difference. Okay, let's let's go from gender now that we push that button and then many people have probably pushed who don't agree have already pushed their own buttons uh, and, and may have left, but let's go to the next, which is not controversial at all, which is race. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. and um, race as a social construct uh, and, um, and so, uh, the statement you make, which w w again, w which is not contentious, you would argue, is that human populations are genetically distinctive in ways that correspond spawn to self-identified race and ethnicity. That's the easy one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, exactly. Because, because a whole lot of uh, people who are looking at this have gotten their twenty-three and Me results. Yeah. How do you suppose it is that twenty-three and Me is able to tell you that you are? 82% German and 14% uh, French and so forth. And the, the answer is, it's not just that uh, you can tell the differences in the continental races, but you can, by using genetic markers, uh, go down to very, very uh, fine granular uh, understandings of, uh, of your origins, of your ancestries. But the thing is at the continental sc scale, it's even more obvious. By the way, these distinctions, uh, which come out of what's called cluster analyses, uh, have nothing to do with uh, the phenotypic behaviors, all right? They, for these analyses, they deliberately try to use what are called genetic markers that have no known effect on any trait. And there are a bunch of them. And by phenotype, one means somehow the expression of genetics. You the know, observed, the observed. Yeah. Uh, so, observed so one's effect. using markers that don't produce any observed uh, effects. Right. And I've got to introduce one bit of jargon because I don't know how you talk about this without it. That's SNP. Yeah. And SNP, okay. single nucleotide polymorphism. And what that means is that you have a base pair in DNA. You have two different, or could be more, uh, uh, vari variants on it. And it can take on different alleles. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the jargon is so hard. To well, I know the idea is that there's, yeah, a, let, let me, that there's a small can, segment of DNA, a, a bunch of letters that can, that can vary in the population. And when they vary, they're expressed in two different ways, red hair, blonde right. hair, blue eyes, brown eyes, that kind of thing. And, so, and some of them do have a, a, an expression in terms of, of that. Some of them don't. You have, you have the different uh, markers, you have the different alleles, but it has no known function, and those are the ones they use. Yeah. So what I'm about to say does not directly imply any genetically caused differences in finality or cognitive ability or anything. But the statement is, is this, that uh, with these markers, you have, well, and, and when, you, when you conduct analyses where you aren't telling the computer anything about the people they're analyzing. You're just mm -hmm. saying, statistically, find the clusters that, that uh, if I tell you to make three clusters, do the best you can statistically to define three distinct ones. And what happens as you increase the number of clusters that you ask the algorithm to produce is that it keeps discriminating people uh, first by their co continental sorts of origin. So if you ask for two clusters, you have those uh, whose origins are in Sub-Saharan Africa versus everywhere else. If you have three clusters, you then have uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Europe and, uh, and Asia. And if you go on to uh, five clusters, you basically have the continental groups and they are separated statistically in terms of these genetic markers. And I say we can do this one quickly at first because there's really no controversy about this anymore. And when I say you've gotten your 23andMe results, that's an indication of how far we've come 
since the first time that these findings emerged in the early 2000s. Yeah, and um, and yeah, so I think, and I think you, but you do try to, but but that, so that's the fact that there are, that there tend to, that, that there are genetic differences between different groups, as you say, if anyone who's been 23 and me recognizes that, but what becomes more contentious is the claim, but you, you say, my goal is to, is to get past the first hurdle in thinking about race differences. And by the way, you make a point of saying, I'm not going to race, I'm going to talk about populations, because I want to do this in an evolutionary perspective, because I want to understand the, the genetic evolution that, that's taken place in, in hominid species. Anyway, to lay out the evidence that it is evolutionarily reasonable to expect that phenotype differences among races in cognitive repertoires could at least be partially genetic, and that expanding knowledge about a genetic variance supports that expectation. So, um, so may do you want to do you want to explain? Um, I mean, it's a reasonable presumption. Do you want to explain um, um, how how differences in 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 genetics that have no phenotype production might lead you to the suspicion that 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 uh, genetic differences also relate to be to at some level impact on behavioral areas. Okay, so so now we go to the next proposition that yeah. uh, that that recent evolution that evolution has been recent and uh, mostly local, mm -hmm. and and this is I think a very important couple of points to get across to people. In the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, you could have Richard Lewontin a uh, famous geneticist uh, died recently uh, at Harvard who said that the very small proportion of the variance among human groups um, is accounted for by genetics. And he was correct. It was about 15%, I think. And also you would have Stephen Jay Gould saying, and for completely understandable reasons, that um, if humans dispersed out of Africa 60 to 80,000 years ago, evolutionarily, that's a blink of an eye. And he's had a famous passage where he says, you know, it's an exigent fact of history. Uh, it could have worked out differently, but, but the fact is that there cannot be important uh, substantive differences between the races because there has been enough time. And as recently as the turn of the 20th century, that was still the, the ruling paradigm for understanding evolution. Evolution by mutation. And mutation is an extremely slow process. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, when you do get mutations, they're almost always deleterious. Mm -hmm. Either they don't have any effect at all on your evolutionary fitness, or they're, <laughs> they're, they make things worse. Yeah. So the, the idea that you can uh, have evolution that's producing new uh, valuable characteristics in humans over an 80,000 year period is just wrong. Okay. The big thing that was found out after the genome was sequenced, and that was in the early 2000s, is that <clears throat> evolution can take place much more rapidly through what's called standing variation. So I'm going to use an analogy to try to get this across. It's completely made up, uh, but I hope it gets the point across. Suppose you think of a set of genetic variants that promote the trait called thriftiness. Okay, mm -hmm. you've got a hunter-gatherer tribe. Uh, there's variation in those uh, SNPs back in the Pleistocene, probably. It's standing variation, but it's not doing anything, in particular because there's My no reason agrees. for it. I have dogs too, so don't worry about it. Uh, there, there's no reason, there's no, it doesn't make you more likely to pass on your genes if you have the characteristic of thriftiness because mm -hmm. everything rots within a few days anyway yeah. and everything's shared in common. As soon as you invent agriculture and it can accumulate surpluses and through sur surpluses accumulate wealth, those same variants begin to have uh, and augment your evolutionary fitness. They do it uh, both because uh, thrifty people are likely to accumulate resources and have better health and, and greater, they live longer and so forth. But also for males, uh, they, there's a sexual selection thing whereby if you're thrifty and you get rich, you're more attractive to women and you're more likely to pass on your genes. So if you think of it that way, 
the variation's already there. You don't need mutations. All you need is an environmental impulse, which, which gives value to those. It becomes comprehensible as to how evolution can take place fairly quickly. Now I've used that and now what I cannot do in the, in the context of this is yeah. explain to you how these geneticists identify that uh, evolution has been taking place and the timing of it. It is for an outsider miraculous. I, yeah. I've read all the techniques. Uh, I could sort of under, it's sort of like understanding quantum physics. Yeah. One night you think you understand and the next morning you don't anymore. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the same in understanding these incredibly ingenious techniques that the geneticists have developed for timing the evolution. But here's, the, here's what they found. Multiple studies, not a subject of argument within the profession, which is a lot of evolution has gone on within historical times. Sure, with thousands. lots of different, you know, the discovery uh, of, of, of different hominid species, Denisovans, hobbits, uh, 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 you know, all, a, a tremendous amount of of hominid evolution since the uh, since out of africa um yeah you've, well, you've also had introgression yeah which it, it, is it, that uh, the humans who left africa interbred with neanderthals and they also interbred with these other uh, hominids that uh, have been discovered and that's in addition to the changes in standing variation that have gone on yeah it's uh, and the second uh, thing that has been found is that different different continental populations which basically correspond to race as, it's, as mm -hmm. the term is used colloquially. Um, it's very local. So that the, the changes in uh, standing variation in Asia, uh, Asian populations uh, are very seldom shared by European or Sub-Saharan African populations. And if you, you put all that together and you have an explanation for why it could be that you have within historical times, and certainly since humans dispersed out of Africa, can have had substantial evolutionary differences develop, which is the subject of the subsequent chapter in the book. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, and, 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 and let, I suppose we can go to that subsequent chapter. I, I will say, I just, I just want to say, you ran something by quickly that may get people thinking. When you talked about your thriftiness example, you're talking about hunter-gatherer society, suddenly it, it's basically a selection effect that appears that didn't appear before that wasn't there before can obviously enhance the, the speed of it uh, of that of that variant being adopted and you said that thrifty people uh, you know become wealthy and that's attractive to women and what you really meant is in a hunter-gatherer society um where there's great scarcity uh it, it, it's it's evolutionarily women who have to who therefore have to uh lactate and, and take of her child need resources at that in those tribal societies and therefore it's it's reasonable to suspect that the people who amass a lot of resources are therefore attractive potential mates. Except that you don't amass resources in a- You, in a, you just, you use them right well. <laughs> yeah, you use them right away. Yeah, okay. But let's <laughs> let's go to the next chapter because I, I, and I think it's important, again, maybe, so one can establish that there's been a tremendous amount of evolution since the time when Stephen Jay Gould thought there hadn't been. Okay, that's an important point. Um, but that there are, that there are um, uh, um, uh, uh, continental population differences and variants are associated with personality, ability, and social behavior are common. That these things result not just in do result in behavioral changes, and 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 I want to go into that. But I think it's really important. Let me uh, that I, I got the sensory book, and let me ask you to to verify this that that, that while you while the, the claim is made that there are differences, continental differences due to population changes, which, and those population, those continental differences generally correspond to what people might say are race right now, um, that there are differences that, that they may not be great. And it, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't um, discredit the fact that within groups, the variations are much greater than the variations between groups. Which is a really important fact. Now, I think I, I got the sense in your book. You kept saying that people stress this fact for political reasons, obviously, but I didn't get the sense that there was any evidence that disagrees with that. No, uh, but the problem if you if you try to phrase this in terms of oh, it's a small percentage of the genome, and, and for a long time, 
Well, it's in the, in the technical literature, it's called Lewontin's fallacy. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the people were writing about it as early as the 1980s, uh, that the idea that just because uh, humans are mostly the same on, on the vast majority of these variants doesn't mean that the remaining differences can't be important. Okay. For, for that matter, I mean, the, the, the genomes of chimpanzees and humans are what, 98% the same? That's, yeah, but there's significant differences. Uh, yeah, and, and so uh, it's a case of having to hold two, two thoughts in your mind at the same time, uh, which is that humans are mostly the same. And uh, there can also nonetheless be significant differences. Uh, it's so really hard for yeah, no, it is. It is. And it's hard to talk about now. But but um, uh, there can be significant differences, which once again, don't have um, necessarily value associated with them. The, the, the differences can be can, can be um, if they exist, can be beneficial in certain circumstances and not beneficial in other circumstances. Yeah. Um, and but the, the, go on. The point is that if you go look at uh, let's say that you have uh, any given SNP, and you have, let's say, one of the alleles promotes uh, schizophrenia. I guess I think that's an example I use in the book. By promotes it, I'm talking about it gives a tiny little bump to the likelihood of schizophrenia. And I'll say parenthetically that another of the discoveries that's quite recent since the uh, sequence in the genome is it used to be thought that you had genes for things, uh, yeah, a gene yeah. for schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And maybe you would have more than one gene, but even at the turn of the century, uh, the best uh, geneticists still thought of 10 or 12 uh, uh, SNPs as being involved was kind of surprising. Well, the answer is that even for, a, for something as simple as height, which we know is 78 80% heritable, you have thousands of SNPs that are associated with height. You have thousands of SNPs associated with IQ uh, or with schizophrenia or anything else. So it's a little, so, but you go back to the example, you have an allele which promotes schizophrenia. Okay, that allele is said to have an allele frequency in a population. For convenience, let's refer to the percentage of people it's actually the percentage of genomes, but yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's think of it in the percentage of people in a population who carry that allele. Let's say it's 80% among Europeans. You can also calculate the allele frequency for that same SNP in uh, sub-Saharan African populations, East Asian populations. Question, is, are the frequency, are the, is the allele frequency similar in all three groups or is it different? Uh, if you're talking within sub-Saharan African populations, the and how different are Kenyans from Nigerians, the answer is the correlation between the allele frequencies is about 0 0.98 to 0.99. And guess what? That's true for East Asian populations, within East Asian populations, and it's true within European populations. The, the degree to which you can look at thousands of different uh, SNPs and, and ask about the correlation of uh, allele frequencies, they're all about 0.9798. Now, physicists don't get excited about that size of a <laughs> correlation. A social scientist, it's unheard of to have correlations that high. And, uh, but if you look at the differences between the populations in Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe, the correlation averages more like 0.7. And similarly, if you look uh, at uh, the Europeans and East Asians, correlations are about 0.7. That's still pretty high. Uh -huh. But as anyone who's worked with correlations knows, if you do a, if you do a scatter plot of uh, something, two variables that have a correlation of 0.7, <laughs> there's a whole lot of scatter in yeah. that. And that's what you see with not just a few uh, of these SNPs, you see these population differences across continents. Now, here's the problem with writing the book two years ago. Is it about 30%, I think? It's, it's a very, very mm -hmm. large percentage. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about blood pressure or you're talking about schizophrenia or uh, blood 
proteins or or social behavior or cognitive ability doesn't make any difference these differences are ubiquitous now the conclusion of that and and large differences are ubiquitous the conclusion from that is not about any specific trait we aren't there yet okay mm -hmm. we're getting there the geneticists are getting there and they're making incredibly rapid progress. That's why I say 10 years and awful lot of this stuff is gonna be understood, but we aren't there yet. I am saying precisely the same thing that David Reich, a very highly respected geneticist at Harvard, I'm, I almost hate to bring him into it because voted by Charles Murray is certainly not David Reich's <laughs> idea of a good time. But he said it in the New York Times op-ed yeah. piece, okay? And he said it very eloquently. People have got to stop saying that what we know as races don't have any important genetic differences. They're going to just be run down by the tsunami, I think he used the word, the tsunami of data. And he went on to say, this is not a catastrophe. He went on to say that these differences won't necessarily be great, but this idea of labeling someone a racist, if they suggest that human groups can be significantly different genetically has got to stop because even though we know, it's an indefensible position. Well, even though, I mean, there are in, you know, in certain diseases, we already know that there are, there are group selection effects that whether you call it race or populations, that certain populations are more susceptible to certain diseases. Which we've is... known that for decades, actually. Yeah. That's yeah. one thing we've done. But we've, we've, for some reason, people have said, even though we've known for a long time, the sickle cell anemia uh, has to be genetically different in, uh, in, and, and that the Tay-Sachs syndrome has to be genetically different between uh, Ashkenazi Jews and other populations. We've known that for a long time. Yeah, sure. Uh, but only for a few traits. And for some reason, we said, oh, well, it can't be anything else. Mm -hmm. And no, it, everything is going to be somewhat different. OK, let's let's move from there in the last 20 minutes or so to to uh, to class, we, we've we, uh, which has got to be less controversial than race or sex. Is anybody still knows. watching us at this point? Yeah, no, believe me, you know, if you're thinking, oh, yes, you know, don't worry, uh, we've uh, this will be no nowhere near the longest podcast, but but, um, okay. but you know I think to look it, one of the goals I want to have is is there are very few places where people can get if they really want to understand something they can get an in depth discussion uh, between people respectful hopefully in depth discussion of ideas and and um, you know people can always take a break but I'm always uh, my experience so far and we'll see what we happen happens here um, is that people often say I, I could you know i would have liked to even heard more so so i i hope that's the case i certainly if i didn't I'm think it was good. if i didn't think it was interesting i would have cut you off now so um i'm, I'm uh, having a good time so i'm willing to go on as long good. as, as long as you're my as long as you're having a good time then i'm having a good time um and 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 i think um but i think it's it's fascinating to discuss these ideas and being able to discuss them uh and so and and stated certain ways as you point out it's just they're not content. It's only when you phrase them in other ways that they appear to be contentious. But it's so obvious that that um, that some things are, are true without any without ascribing any ideological or value significance to those statements. They become clear. It's only when you when you ascribe and we'll talk about in in, in the next few minutes uh, near the end of this the ideolo ideological aspect of of this, which is which is so worrisome. But anyway, let's talk about class and your and 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 I think we can go through this a little more. Swiftly, it's one of the areas where you've gotten clearly a lot of pushback as well. But the basic statement you're making is that, well, I'll, 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 let me let me I, you 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 say it. My proposition is that racism and sexism are no longer decisively important in determining who rises to the top. To support that proposition, I'm about to demonstrate that ethnic differences in two major components of class, economic attainment and income, nearly disappear for people at similar IQs. And um, and then you also say racism and sexism still play a role in determining who rises to the top, but that role is not decisive. We can have a range of opinions about whether the roles of racism and sexism merit the adjective large or small, 
and advocate public different public policies depending upon our different perspectives without affecting the relevance of the role of genes, environment, and the interaction that continue uh, that constitute the topic uh, of, of, of class. So the and, and I think the again, I'm gonna I'm going so one of the things you've gotten a lot of pushback for is basically saying that at some level, what you might call um, intelligence, which is just an accident of nature, plays a large role in what is emerging to be distinct class differences, which are independent of race, uh, more than more than depend upon on on relative, uh, as you would call it, IQ. Um, uh, but um, but also the other thing that I think was really important that I got out of reading this, which I think is, well, for me even more fascinating, because I always like not knowing rather than knowing in a sense, because it means there's a lot we have to learn, is that the dominant factor that appears to be, and and by and, and when you say this, you also tie in. And I guess I'll, I'm going to kind of put the last three or three things together. You tie in your experience that, given this fact that intelligence is 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 crucially related to some success factor in our modern society that many efforts to by governments and local industry local groups to intervene are uh, uh, and programs that do that are, are guaranteed to not be successful at some level which has caused you a lot of grief i'm sure that statement but but it's worth pointing out that you've been involved in this for a long time and from the from the from actively being involved in at the in, in the peace corps to studying this later on um but so so not just that but the, the 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 really remarkable thing is that the chief determining factor that determines sort of behavior that's going to lead to success or happiness or many other things is completely unknown it's not parental guidance it's not genetic but it's due to unsupervised environment in a way that no one understands and I, so those I've thrown a lot of things together, but I want to. I want to just sort of well, merge well, them together. Okay, so here is a concept, uh, another jargony concept that's really important: the distinction between the shared environment and the non-shared environment. Uh, the shared environment are the, the things that most people think of when they think of environmental causes of economic success, socioeconomic status, and so forth. That would include uh, the income of the family, uh, the educational attainment of the parents the parenting styles, the quality of the neighborhood, the quality of the schools. That's, that's shared to some degree by all siblings, but it's shared most cleanly by twins. Yeah, and you study twin studies. Because twins are born at the same moment in a marriage. They're born at the same moment in the socioeconomic trajectory of the family over time, et cetera, et cetera. And so you've had a very powerful research tool in uh, taking large samples of uh, fraternal twins and examining their their similarities and large samples of identical twins and uh, looking at their similarities. This is a completely separate thing from uh, the famous studies of identical twins raised apart. Mm -hmm, that those yeah. are interesting, they're fun, they're informative, but the really large sample studies are not twin twins raised apart, they're twins raised together because mm -hmm. that gives you algebraically a way of partitioning what's going on to illustrate why, and I won't go through the algebra, uh, fraternal twins share 50% of their genes, yeah. of their parents' genes, uh, or of, of, excuse me, of their, each other's genes. Identical twins, one egg, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, they, uh, they share 100% of their genes, yeah. effectively, two to one. Yeah. And, and algebraically, that enables you to compute what proportion of the uh, variation you observe is accounted for by her her the genes by is heritable? It allows you to compute what proportion is uh, accounted for by the shared environment. And if whatever is left over is called the non-shared environment. That's actually inaccurate uh, insofar as it includes two things. It includes the non-shared environment and it also includes measurement error. Mm, okay, and measurement yes. error in the social sciences 
is a big deal. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's a, of, it's a, it's a big deal in all of science. Things. The only difference is in physics, we can know we know our measurement error is generally better than you do in social sciences. But it's an yeah, errant it's part true. of science, and it frustrates me that people don't realize that. That's the great thing about science is we can try and quanti quantify our, our uncertainties instead of just ignoring them. Anyway, the, the, the finding that came out starting in the 1980s, because this technique has been known for a long time uh, and a lot mm -hmm. of work has been done. So the, the startling thing that was first identified in the 1980s was the heritability of almost all traits is substantial. It varies depending on what the trait may be, but it's substantial. The surprising part was how little was explained by the shared environment. And by the way, this is depressing news for all parents, including me. Yeah. Uh, we like to think that as parents, we account for a lot in how our kids turned out. And I continue to believe that's true. And in fact, I can appeal to some empirical evidence for that. As my wife likes to put it, we can teach our kids to be nice even if we can't teach them to be smart and teach them to be good we can, mm -hmm. we, we can socialize them to some mm -hmm. degree and that's an important thing to do uh, but the the proportion of things that people have always thought historically were hugely affected by environment the, shared, the factors in the shared environment aren't uh, this has huge implications for what you can expect from attempts to change things. Yes. And this is, this is where I'm not saying that. Okay, I am identified with one branch of the interpretation of this, which says this really constrains what you can expect out of environmental interventions. And there is a uh, book by Catherine Page Harden that's come out recently, the title of which I don't recall offhand, which uses a lot of the same science um, and, and describes it accurately and comes to much more optimistic conclusions about how we can still use in interventions to make a difference. So, I, I will phrase the argument that I think is a plausible one and a reasonable one, which is it's highly constrained. Because if you're starting out with an environmental influence, let's let's since people are always talking about how you raise test scores, yeah. I mean that's one of the main yeah. goals of pre-K and I don't the rest know why, of it. But it's, uh, it's supposed uh, to be yeah. an American fixation. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. If it's the case that the shared environment only accounts for 20%, let's say, of that and I'm probably being generous. Um, okay, so you've got 20% that can be twiddled with through really effective programs, presumably. But the problem is that any intervention you have is going to comprise a small fraction of the total environmental environment mm -hmm. uh, that the child is in. And so simply as a matter of math, you're looking at a potential change, even given a really good program that is severely constrained. And, uh, and I will be happy if people will simply accept that and stop believing <laughs> every time the New York Times gives you the latest story of miraculous increases in IQ produced by a by some program uh, because you look, you have short-term effects of the exit test sometimes, a lot of times you don't, those attenuate over time. And yeah. the, overall, the overall story is genes are a big portion of all kinds of personality factors, uh, all kinds of cognitive abilities and an awful lot of social behavior. It's not, this is not genetic determinism. Yeah. Uh, it's, we, it's, we're talking about explaining modest proportions of the variance. Uh, we live with a great deal of uncertainty, whether genetic or environmental. No, it's not genetic determinism. It's just saying it's an important aspect. And we have in the past way overestimated uh, the direct effects of the way that we raise kids. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, uh, that... Um... Those two are, things are, are very important. I, I, I tend to take more, I don't know whether solace is the word, 
from the fact that the largest component is still not understood, which I'll get to in a second. I, I guess the 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 thing that doesn't surprise me so much, I mean, as a parent, you realize this immediately, but I think in general, it's a, I, I once described it recently to someone saying it was really a property of entropy in physics, but the, effectively, it's just a lot easier to do bad than it is to do good. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to damage your children than to, to, than to improve them, I think. And, and, and it's just a, I think a property of nature. And, and so I think you said, I mean, it's, it's, you know, clearly you can abuse a child and, and really have severe impacts, but incrementally it's much harder and it's hard to society. It's a lot easier to have a, to have the effects of, of say someone who's a, not a self-made billionaire becomes president. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and and have those bad effects than it is to try and improve problems. It's just a lot easier to do one than the other. And but at the same time, the area where I might disagree, uh, and people will probably say I've been too kind, and, but I accept it's all science, and therefore I I can't help but agree with the data in a sense, and 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 find it compellingly interesting, is that while it's tr uh, while I think the data is clearly definitive that 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 parenting perhaps doesn't have as much impact as you think it would and and as you point out that while parent you know rich parents can solve problems that kids have that poor parents can't do in certain cases if the, especially if the kids run into problems um the fact that so much that that the unshared environment has such a big impact suggests to me as someone who's much more amenable to to, to new social policies let's say that if as we learn more about what aspects of the unshared environment really do help or change what help or hurt we might be able to exploit that once we learn about the, how, how biologically that that unmanipulated environment has an impact we might be able to think, think of new ways to manipulate things in a way to have programs that are more effective what do you think about that well let let me try to dash all of your hopes good as best i can okay uh first place some very smart people have been working on precisely that issue mm -hmm. robert plowman has been one of the leading people who have been trying to 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 figure out this non-shared environment and he's been working on it for decades now and they've made quite little progress as he he, he will say but i i let me just offer instead two other observations uh, one is any parent who has had more than one child knows that those two kids had characteristics that were quite different from the sure. get-go that you recognize in the first few weeks of life in yeah. some cases. And furthermore, I think parents of more than one child recognize there is no way that they are able to change the second kid to be more like the first kid or mm -hmm. vice versa. Sure. Uh, it just, it, the, the impossibility of that becomes apparent pretty quickly. Oh, so I'm saying basically our experience is passed with these traits and their intractability it generalizes to a larger population. A second thing that I would offer in terms of, of caution about what we're gonna learn about the non-shared environment goes to the phenomena known as I'm getting old and I'm becoming more and more like my mother yeah, for girls and I'm becoming more and more like my dad, like for boys, yeah. uh, more like my parents. And that is reflected in the data on heritability over time. So let's take, go back to the case of standardized test scores and IQ, uh, the heritability of IQ uh, normally for five-year-olds is pretty low. It's mm -hmm. maybe point. 3.4 and uh it goes up and so by adolescence it's up around 0 0.5 0 0.6 and by full uh, you know full maturity it can rise up near 0 0.8 and so you say to yourself why should that be because intuitively you would say you start out with your genes but your environment accumulates over time and presumably the effect of the environment should accumulate over the time, over time. The alternative is to say this, and I'm offering this as an analogy. We're way off the, this is things we don't have to argue about anymore. Yeah. We can yeah. argue about this one, but I'll just present it as my, my okay. own view. 
I've come to. And that is that a lot of us, as we grow up, particularly in adolescence, we are consciously rebelling against our, our, uh, uh, our genetic tendencies because we're rebelling against our parents, we're rebelling against whatever. We do a lot of things when we're 18, 19, 20, and into, through our 20s, which are experimental. We're trying stuff. And as time goes on, we got a form of regression to the mean, yeah. uh, which is that um, those are in a way aberrations from natural tendencies and those aberrations diminish and you generalize that statement and that can help account for the increasing heritability of IQ, of personality traits or the rest of it. This is not dispositive proof at all. It is an attempt to say we have a very well-established phenomena of increasing heritability with age. And uh, this is one way of thinking about it that might be fruitful. Okay, it's good. I, I Okay, I, I do want to get to the, the now I want to move to sort of your thoughts about your more value judgments about how this impacts on society. But I will, I, I do want to read this, uh, because it, it, um, you say it shouldn't this the goal, which is, is is to is to try and understand class structure and where it comes from, it should not obscure a larger truth. The bulk of the variance in success in life is unexplained by either nature or nurture. Researchers are lucky if they can explain half of the variance in educational achievement attainment with measures of abilities and socioeconomic background. They're lucky if they can explain even a quarter of the variance in earned income by such measures. The takeaway for thinking about our future as individuals is that we do not live in a deterministic world ruled by either genes or social background, let alone race or gender. But Proposition Nine, which is about social classes, um, is about is about classes, not individuals. The takeaway for thinking about the future of modern Western societies is that the role of genes is important for shaping class structure. So instead, instead of the so it basically says we don't live in a deterministic world. It's not saying genetic determinism, but genes are significant. And in the and and in your last few, few chapters, where you start to talk, about, you begin to talk about about value and i want to give a few quotes and 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 end in the you know we'll go on for about another five or ten minutes um sure. um <clears throat> you say, say i submit that the evidence is conclusive enough to warrant treating them as facts the implication is that advanced societies have replaced one form of unfairness with another the old form of unfairness was that talented people were prevented from realizing their potential because of artificial barriers rooted in powerlessness and lack of opportunity. The new form of unfairness is that talent is largely a matter of luck and that the few who are so unusually talented that they rise to the top are the beneficiaries of luck in the genetic lottery. The future, and then I jump ahead here, and, and that's, the, that's the end of one chapter and you begin the next by saying, the future of the liberal arts, when you talk about the future, therefore, lies therefore in addressing the fundamental questions of human existence head on without embarrassment or fear, taking them from the top down in easily understood language and progressively rearranging them into domains of inquiry that unite the best of science and humanities in each level of organization. And, 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 and so the, the first statement is that basically it is a genetic lottery. And when people talk about lucky genes, sometimes they mean but the ones I've heard of talk about usually I mean they their parents were rich, but but your argument is that that really the and your talk and and when you get to your value judgments that there's a real problem with society in the fact of what we do about the fact that 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 lucky genes or talent produces a, a socioeconomic class structure and what we're going to do about it. So so I want I want I want I want you to elaborate on that concern about that constraint and what we might do as a society. Yeah, and I would also suggest to uh, people who are watching this that they read a book by Michael Sandel, who's a philosopher at Harvard, uh, called The Tyranny of Meritocracy that came yes. out uh, about a year ago, I think, and is a very thoughtful discussion of this problem. The the, and Dick Hernstein and I were also aware of this when we wrote The Bell Curve. And if you go to the last chapter of The Bell Curve, uh, you will see 
a lot of what I'm about to say now. The one, of, one perfectly reasonable response to the importance of luck uh, in the genetic lottery is to say, well, what we need to do is, is to redistribute the world's goods uh, more effectively in a Rawlsian kind of fashion, John Rawls, uh, because the inequality is not justified by merit. That's perfectly natural response. I think that a better response is not to say that that's going to solve anything, but rather to frame the question as being one of how do you have a society which provides an abundance of valued places for people of a very broad range of abilities and characteristics uh, to fit. And by a valued place, I mean, if you were gone, people would miss you. And that can be because uh, of a family and spouse and children. It can be because of a community that would miss you. I suppose it can be because your place of employment would miss you. Uh, it can also be because your faith community will miss you. Mm -hmm. I have to introduce that. Um, it was next on my list. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, this is, but this is much more important. So, so in other words, I'm saying, suppose we take someone who's gotten the short end of the stick uh, on a variety of ways. They're, they're below average in IQ. They're below average in beauty. They're below average in charm. They're below average in their personal skills. They're below average in industriousness. And uh, all of these are if you get down to it, not their fault because they were unlucky in the draw. They need a society where they are not going to get rich, uh, but they will have enough. And I will say parenthetically, I'm in favor of universal basic income. Yeah, I was going to talk, if we had more and, time, uh, I was going to talk about that, but that's uh, important. And, and, uh, but, but much more than that, much more important than the income is that they have a valued place. How can you do that? You can have a society where it is widely rec you know, recognized and celebrated that uh, uh, marriage is a wonderful source of the most intimate human contact and family is. A society in which communities are so constructed that the communities are engaged in important activities that have lots of work need to be done with them with everybody so that, that uh, you can contribute to that. You, you, you need a lot of niches for a lot of people. And now we're really getting to my own predilections. My own view is that a decentralized, uh, not a pure libertarian society, but a very decentralized society where the action, the stuff of life is conducted at a local level to the maximum extent is the one that produces the richest assortment of valued places. Uh, that is very much my own view. I am not going to diss anybody who disagrees with it, uh, but I would say that's the right, right way of framing the problems that we have to come to grips with. We are not going to fix the uh, unfairnesses of the genetic lottery through income redistribution. Well, okay. That, that, would, that, is, that is sort of, that's sort of uh, one thing that, that might have effects at the margin. It is not give people meaningful, satisfying lives. Well, uh, okay. I, and I wanted, I'm, it's perfect. I'm glad, well, I'm glad I gave you that forum because I wanted to move to this personal view, which, which you express eloquently here. It's a part of what I agree with so much of what you said. Part of it I disagree with. I'm, I, I think one, uh, not, uh, I agree with everything you said. Personally, I would say it's not so much a decentralized society that's done at the local level. I, I think I, I would like a society where all of the basic needs are met by government, uh, and those basic needs are health, education, um, and 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 safety, and um, and those those are needs which are not being met. I would argue in many countries, and particularly in the United States. But but let me. But I don't. But. But my view is, well, well, this is a dialogue and not an interview. I, I want to focus on what you said. And, and I, I want to read what you said because you wrote it so eloquently. And I find it so, I, 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 so wonderful. So let me just say my argument begins with two apparently unrelated propositions. First, the ultimate goal of public policy is not to do things like raise incomes or increase college graduation rates, 
but to enable people to flourish and to achieve deep satisfactions in life, to pursue happiness in the Aristotelian sense of the word. Second, recent decades have seen the development of a new upper class that I described in Coming Apart, another one of your books, not just influential and affluent, but smart, highly educated with its own distinctive culture, significantly, significantly cut off from the mainstream of American society. It's the same group, no longer emergent, but having come to power, that Richard Hernstein and I called the cognitive elite in the bell curve. The new upper class includes, though is not limited to, people who are the, have the leading roles in shaping the nation's economy, culture, and politics. For me, what matters most is not material equality, but access to the wellsprings of human flourishing, which in turn requires that society be structured so that people across a wide range of personal qualities and abilities are able to find valued places, as you just said. And then, and, and related to what you just said to me, you then say, what the new upper class can do is honor the wellsprings. That means, for example, celebrating marriage, not just as one of many options, but as an institution that gives the most people the best chance of creating a, a deep and fulfilling intimate relationship with another adult. It means celebrating to, uh, uh, Tocquevillian community, whether it is found in a small town or a neighborhood in a, in a metropolis or megalopolis. And it means celebrating productive works, works of all kinds. It means celebrating the fulfillment that people of faith derive from their faith. Celebrating does not mean passing laws. It means that people who sit at the apex of the nation's politics, economics, and culture need to be advocates for marriage, community, productive work, and at the least, to treat religion with respect. Well, so I, I, I think the notion that, that we as a society should value everyone is one that is, is incredibly laudable. And the notion that we are, that wherever the elites come from, whether, whether as you argue, and I think for good re give com compelling arguments behind, that elites now are being, are being caused by, by genetic uh, talents more than other more than other areas in human history where elites were caused by other other cons other constraints other social constraints but that we should celebrate everyone um you know th whether we determine that marriage is always the best way to do it is not something i disagree with but i was also intrigued by you, the fact that you 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 say we need to treat religion with respect and 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 that people that we we recognize people of faith derive something from their faith but I wanted to go back to what, what I said to you at the beginning. You, I surprised you're not really a person of faith. You're a person who'd like to have faith. And so I'm intrigued that you put that up there among the, among the things that you value, that, that you think society should value. Because I think we should respect people, but I don't see any reason to respect religion. <laughs> okay. You've just opened up another three-hour conversation. Well, let's, let's do it in two minutes because I, I want to uh, end. With, I'm going to read a final quote for me to end, but, but one, one, I wonder, wonder why you put that in there. Obviously, your wife has influenced you, and you can see the satisfaction that the, from the Quaker community that you've been growing. We talked. That's why I wanted to talk about it at the beginning. Yeah, well, but, but are there uh, other arguments? Okay. There's a, there, the social science argument. Okay. I mean, uh, people get something from yeah, religion, but, no, but my a, question is... Science? My question is, it's not so much, I won't, don't deny that people get something useful from religion. If they didn't, it wouldn't be so ubiquitous in human society. Clearly, it serves, a, 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 a whether you say an evolutionary purpose or a cognitive purpose. The question I, I wonder is, can you get the same thing without having religion? Do you, why do you need religion to give that? Can't we, can't we have quantum mechanics classes every Sunday instead of... Instead of... <laughs> uh... Let's put it this way. I also have respect for people without faith. <laughs> and, and I'm only asking that they quit uh, talking as if only that smart people don't believe that stuff anymore. Ah, I agree with you completely because, there. Because one of the things that I have discovered over the last 15, 20 years, uh, and again, affected by my wife and the experiences there is, I have met a whole lot of people of faith who I have been increasingly convinced have access to ways of knowing that I do not. And here is the analogy that I finally came up with. I think it's, I think it's similar to tone deafness. Um, for genetic reasons, some people are tone deaf. 
That yes. does not mean that the music of Beethoven is not beautiful. It means they, for not, reasons not their fault, can't hear it. Uh, same as colorblindness, uh, literal colorblindness. I think that in matters of faith, there is a genetic element there. And if you want to, you can say, yes, some people have more of gene for deluding themselves than others. And that is one, that is one parsimonious explanation. Mm -hmm. I am inclined to think that it's more analogous to tone deafness. I think it is, I think some people have, it, it's harder for them to access faith uh, for genetic reasons. And oh. the genetic reason, uh, the genetic reasons constitute a disability in some sense. Well, that's where, and, it, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, well, I would agree with you. I agree with everything you said there, except for the disability. I wouldn't put the value yeah, judgment. Uh, uh, I would I'm, say, I'm, I'm sure. and it's this notion that people say loss of faith as if loss of faith is a bad thing. I would argue, in fact, um, maybe it's like, um, well, mountain climbers, some people aren't afraid of heights. And, and to me, it's, I'd rather have the gene that makes me, or the thousand genes that make me afraid of heights than, than, than take some of the chances of Martin Connors. Okay. But, but I don't I view, was... I don't view it, I guess I don't view it as a loss or a disability. I, there's no doubt that I recognize I, my lack of, my perfect comfort and happiness with the lack of faith may have a genetic basis. Uh, I also I... think it has an intellectual one. Yeah, but, 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 but... But we, we, we're at an impasse here and would be at an impasse no longer how, how long we talked. Uh, no, I know, I know. But I, I felt it, I, I, it's I, important to, I've been, you know, I, I think it's important that there are two sides of this. And, 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 and what, but what I, what I will, what I will agree with you completely about is the fact that, that, that it is ridiculous for people to claim that if people have faith that they're somehow stupid or that only people who don't think faith. I, I think uh, the scriptures are nonsense, but but people having a deep <laughs> sense of faith is a different is a different thing. But I don't. But let me give you the last word here. Uh, we I, I thought it was worthwhile having that brief conversation, but sure. I, I just want to read the last paragraph of your book, which I find um, beautiful. When we are able to once again once again to talk easily about human differences, a difficult and elusive next step remains. The wellsprings of human flourishing have been going dry for many Americans, and the damage done by the new upper class, however inadvertently, has been importantly to blame. Replenishing and revitalizing those wellsprings should be our first priority. But developing policies that replenish and revitalize them must begin with a drastic shift in thinking of most of the people who run the nation's economy, culture, and politics. It's time for America's elites to try living with inequality of talents, understanding that each human being has strengths and weaknesses, qualities we admire and qualities we do not admire, and that our good opinion seldom turns on people's talents, but rather on a person's character. We need a new species of public policy that accepts differences and works with people as they are, not as we want to shape them. I hope this book contributes to that process. Let me say two things about that beautiful paragraph. First of all, it's clearly not the statement of a racist or a sexist or a genetic determinist. And secondly, I hope that your book does help continue to the process, even if we may differ about policy issues. But the, the goal of what you just said there is something that I don't see how anyone could disagree with. And I, and I do want to thank you for your patience in spending time with me going over some of this. So I do I thank you. Thank you for a chance to, uh, to say the things I've said and to tell you how much I've enjoyed the conversation. Oh, great. Well, that's, uh, thank you. It's, and I, I, I'm sure the people who listen and listen carefully will benefit greatly. So thanks again. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.